Hi everybody, I am Missy Matthews. We are a few days removed from the 2020 NFL Draft and I am pleased to be joined for our virtual roundtable this week by Bob Lariola, my cohort from Steelers.com and our very special guest, our privilege to be speaking with Judy Batista of NFL Network and NFL.com. Judy, thanks for joining us. Thank you guys for having me from my bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so I take it uh, you live in New York, correct? Yes, yes. That is where you took in the draft. Explain to us what it was like for you covering this draft. Um, well, like I covered it like everybody else, right? In sweats, like from my home, from my sofa. Um, it, it was actually fine. I loved this draft. I, I thought it was, first of all, the fact that it went off without a hitch technically is a miracle. I know nothing about how they managed to do it, but it was amazing how smoothly it flowed. Um, and I loved it. I loved how personal it was. It was sort of intimate. You got to see the head coaches and the general managers with their families. And I loved seeing the players at home with their families. I loved seeing what their homes looked like. I loved seeing how they were decorated. I just thought it was um, very personal this year. And, you know, given the circumstances we're all in, I, it sort of struck the right chord at the right moment, I think. You know, it kind of reminded me. Do you think there's me. aspects from the virtual draft that could potentially be carried on in future years whenever everybody doesn't have to be at home? Yeah, I mean, look, I am sure that head coaches and GMs are going to want to be in their war rooms, right? I mean, the, the communication is so much easier when everybody's sitting around a table and can talk to each other face to face. But, um, I, you know, I talked to Roger Goodell after the first round late on Thursday night, and he loved being able to talk to more of the players, right? Because they had sent out like a hundred of those media kits that had iPhones and things like that. He loved being able to talk to more guys because when he's at the draft, a regular draft, right? The guys come onto the stage, they're picked, they walk onto the stage, we all see the big bro hugs and then they go off and they do their thing. And so there's like, you know, seconds that they interact. In this case, he got to talk to them during the commercial breaks and while teams were making their picks. Um, and he got to do it with many more guys than, than he does at the draft. And so I think especially we'll see that element continue, especially you know for the day two guys, like second and third round type of picks. I think we'll see that. I'm sure teams will be in their war rooms. I'm sure we'll still have players come to a green room at, at the draft. But, but I think you're going to see some of those virtual elements carry over. It would, you know, watching it from home, uh, it reminded me of when, you know, ABC, which always televised the Olympics, first went to those um, little vignettes that they would interject in the uh, coverage of whatever sport it was, and they called them up close and personal. And it allowed the viewers to get a little bit of a in-depth personal view of some of these athletes you know, especially Olympic sports, the, the, the normal viewer doesn't really know that much about the people who are the skiers and the skaters and, you know, those kinds of things. And I, I think that uh, it really helped maybe move the Olympics beyond just the people who were interested in downhill skiing and slalom racing, ice hockey and whatever, into an audience where, you know, people might be more apt to watch just to you know, for the human element of it a little bit. And I think that on, while this isn't my personal taste, I understand that it's a television show. And, and I think that what the league uh, touched on a little bit this year, maybe being forced to, is they made it a broader based uh, appeal broadcast. And I think that, you know, the numbers were, were through the roof this year, uh, but it was a captive audience. I would be interested to see, you know, once regular programming, normal programming, you know, is competing with the NFL draft, if some of the changes uh, that they made for this year's draft, if they carry them over, how that might impact maybe drawing more viewers into it who are more interested not to see whether, you know, the Texans picked an offensive tackle or an edge rusher, but you know, who some of these people are, Joe Burrow, you get the Heisman Trophy winner, what's his family like, what's his house look like, you know, those kind of things. I, I thought, um, you know, and I, they certainly didn't plan on this, but I thought like the, the head coaches and the GMs having like their kids around while they were drafting, you know, the dog, um, being able to see what their work area was like, uh, I thought that's, that's all good stuff, it humanizes them, 
you know, we, because of our jobs, see these guys up close a little more and know a little bit more about them personally and their family life. But most fans never get that peek behind the curtain, right? I mean, you just don't, you, you know, you don't know what Jason Light's family looks like. You know, you don't know that Matt Rule has two daughters who dress up in cheerleader costumes and cheer behind their dad when he's making the pick. Like, that humanizes them. And I think that's important because I think for those of us, for people on the outside, I think, you know, we see them only through football. This comes up on Black Monday, the day after the season when coaches get fired every year. We sort of, we forget that they're humans, right? We forget the, the trickle down effect on their families. We forget that they have families. I thought this was, this was a great moment to say like, like these, are, these are guys who are like doing their jobs while their kids are climbing all over them. They're sort of like everybody else who has to work from home. I thought it sort of, it, it, it made them more like everybody else. And that's a rarity in the NFL. You know, reading up on other teams, just how the GMs and coaches said, it was kind of nice to work from home. To have they liked it. Something probably during this time of the year, they're not doing because they're in the office so much, in meetings, watching film, uh, rearranging their draft board and things like that. So maybe this is a, a little life lesson. Um, I think even just my husband and I feel the same way. You know, there's different things that we can do moving forward that just help our family. And I feel like maybe the NFL stage is also proving that as well to a lot of people. Yeah, you know, I talked to Brian Flores from the Miami Dolphins um, on Sunday afternoon. Now, now he's got young children and um, he said he's really loved this time. Like, obviously there are sort of accommodations that you have to make for work, but he's loved being at home. He's been at home for dinner every night, which he says never happens. Um, he's been able to help his kids, you know, with their homework. Um, never would happen under normal circumstances. And he said, look, you know, when they're in the facilities, the the instinct is always like, well, let me let me watch one more bit of tape. Let me go through this. Because obviously that wasn't the case this year. You were home. And he says it's been great. And it makes him wonder if, you know, next year when hopefully we're back to normal, if especially in the off season, if guys will say like, I can go home at six o'clock and have dinner and help the kids with the homework. And then maybe at night when the kids are asleep, you watch some tape, but try to, um, to change a little bit. He, look, he said, during the regular season, that's probably out the window. Everybody's still gonna be in their offices working, but this is the off season. And I think this showed them that it's possible to have maybe a little bit more balance in their lives than they're used to having. Judy, let me ask you this from a uh, just straight draft perspective. Was there a team or a move that surprised you the most and is gonna make you always remember the 2020 NFL draft? Well, I think I'm not alone in this. The Packers taking a quarterback in the first round. <laughs> I, you know, I was working. Uh, again, I was watching it in my living room and, and then in the bedroom and I was working and I wasn't looking up at the screen. But when that pick was announced, I did a double take at my television. Like, wow, um, that's going to be interesting. And whenever we get to training camp and to a season, that dynamic is going to be awfully interesting to watch in Green Bay. Um, Aaron Rodgers with the brain trust and with now, you know, is what we think is probably his heir apparent, um, you know, and why they picked a quarterback as high as they did with Aaron Rodgers still seemingly playing at an extremely high level and likely able to for another few years. He certainly has made it clear he plans to play at least until he's 40 and possibly beyond like Tom Brady. And so that, that was the eye opener for me of the draft. The thing that uh, really stood out to me and what rocked Steelers Nation to the core was when it was kind of a combination of two things. The Steelers did not pick J.K. Dobbins and the Baltimore Ravens did. I mean, that had to be the <laughs> most disastrous, you know, 10 minutes in the history of a lot of Steelers fans' lives, at least recently or so my email inbox would indicate. Um, but uh, that to me was, I won't say it surprised me, uh, because I frankly would have been surprised if the Steelers had not picked a receiver first with their first pick. Um, but I really thought that, um, you know, kind of Kevin and Mike Tomlin hinted at what, where they were going on the Monday pre-draft news conference when they were asked about the running back. Mike Tomlin said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, we plan on running the ball better in 2020, whether we pick a running back high or not. And when they were at, when Kevin was asked about it, he immediately 
uh, drew the narrative back to his belief in James Conner as the number one running back in the NFL. And so, you know, to me, they kind of hinted what they were what they were going to do, but when it actually happened, I just I'm curious if the reaction would have been the same if, say, J.K. Dobbins was drafted by the Lions. If <laughs> probably yeah. not, right? Probably. Right? <laughs> I, look, I have, I, well, certainly I'm in no position to second guess how the Steelers draft. They have a pretty good history at it. But um, I, I don't think you can be surprised that they took a wide receiver uh, with their first pick in the draft. Let's face it, I was at La Trobe with you guys last year at training camp, and we spent the entire day on the air at NFL Network talking about the wide receiver situation. Um, Antonio Brown, of course, was you know gone, and how was Juju going to do, and who else were the receivers? you know, that was a year ago, it still hasn't been solved. So they had to do something. And uh, what I also think they did, what they've done in total this off season um, is they, they clearly have a great deal of confidence in their quarterback situation. They obviously have a great deal of confidence that Ben is going to be just fine whenever we get back. Um, you know, they, they're putting pieces around Ben clearly because they think they still have what it takes at the number one position to win at the very highest level. With Tom Brady now in Tampa Bay, what what does that mean for the AFC, who's just been tortured by him in recent years? <laughs> well, look, I think the balance of power was already starting to shift. Let's face it, Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs were in the AFC championship game two straight years. They won, of course, this year. They were an overtime away from getting to the Super Bowl last year. So uh, certainly, I think we were starting to see things maybe shift a little bit out of New England. But this is, uh, you know, if you're a team in the AFC East in particular, like it's New Year's Day every day right now. This is the greatest thing ever. Um, look, it opens it up because that is a team that was, you knew you could almost always pencil in. It was going to get not just to the playoffs, but probably get at least one game into the playoffs. And for years and years and years, it was always the AFC championship game. They were in the AFC championship game an astonishing number of times. So that removes that now. Now, I have no idea what they're going to look like this year. Let's see if they make any other moves at quarterback. I, you know, I don't think you can discount what Bill Belichick might be thinking and how he's going to plan. Um, but certainly it removes, you know, a roadblock that's been there for two decades in, in the AFC. It reduces the number of teams that you view as, you know, almost impenetrable. However, the power is clearly in Kansas City right now, right? I mean, uh, Patrick Mahomes is going to be a nightmare for everybody for, you know, 15 years at least. Um, we've already seen him run roughshod through uh, the NFL over the last two years, and I, I can't imagine that's going to change. I think you saw, for instance, in Denver, you saw them draft speed, 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 speed. That's they clearly realize if you're going to try to keep up with the Chiefs or catch the Chiefs, you're going to have to run with them. And uh, the Denver Broncos made the moves. And I think you're going to see teams, not just in the AFC, but throughout the league, recognize that the, the Chiefs are the team everybody's got to catch right now. The way I'm looking at it is, um, you know, I want to see where the Chiefs are when they have to pay their quarterback. Sure. Because they don't have to pay their quarterback. Baltimore doesn't have to pay its quarterback. I mean, this, to me, the league now has changed from one where you wanted to be the team with Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers and Ben Roethlisberger. Uh, and now because of the cap and what you have to pay those guys, the best place to be is with a quarterback who is um, good or better on his rookie deal, and you can spend your money on everything else and you put together a really good team, a contending team. Uh, but I think now the Chiefs, he's going into his fourth year, right, Patrick Mahomes? Yes. Yes, okay. So now they're going to have to start writing checks to Patrick Mahomes. And, you know, it's it, it, you have to. You have to pay the guy. And um, I, I just I, I want to see how they're able to manage it. Keep, and keep I, keeping I in mind, so and this is going to work in the Chiefs' favor and other teams, you know, with the new collective bargaining agreement um, next year, don't forget they're going to add a 17th game, the revenue, and they're going to have the new TV contracts come online. So the revenue should get a huge jump. And so the salary cap should go up quite a bit. That will help 
teams that have to sign the quarterbacks to big deals. They're, they're, the Chiefs are lucky that that's coming. And for that matter, so are the Dallas Cowboys who have to get Dak under contract at some point. Same thing. But there's no question the ideal formula in the NFL now. We saw it with Carson Wentz with the Eagles when they made their run. Um, he, he wasn't in the Super Bowl, but he was on a cheap deal. Um, you saw it with Jared Goff when the Rams made their run to the Super Bowl. Um, you know, obviously, like you said, we've seen it with Lamar in Baltimore. You saw it with Mahomes in the Chiefs. The teams that have their quarterbacks on the cheap rookie deals and then can spend wildly on everything else around them are at an enormous advantage. Um, you know, but again, for the teams that are going to have to give those big contracts, they're lucky with their timing because the the salary cap should take a pretty hefty uh, spike here when the new TV deals come online. Judy, now that the draft is over, some teams are doing virtual workouts, virtual classroom work. Uh, some teams like the Saints said, hey, we'll see you in training camp. Um, where does the league go from here in terms of potentially reopening facilities and just moving forward in their calendar year? So uh, when I talked to Roger Goodell after the first round of the draft late Thursday night, he said the first priority after the draft ended was going to be trying to figure out how to get teams back in their facilities. Um, that is a big ask because as you guys know, uh, you know, the stay at home orders vary uh, all over the country, right? I mean, some states, Georgia is already somewhat back. Texas is looks like it's about to go back. Um, and then there are some parts of the country that are clearly not close to going back. The New York area is certainly one of them. California doesn't look like it's going back anytime soon. So they've got to try to manage that. How do you get teams back to their facilities? Um, from a competitive equity standpoint, uh, Goodell made it clear, they've all said it, they are not going to let any teams go back until all teams can go back. So they've got to figure out, do they perhaps move some teams to other areas, let them go, you know, the same way as teams go away for training camp, would you let teams go away to do their off season programs so that everybody can be back at the same time? They're trying to stay as on schedule as they can. That's a big part of the reason why they went ahead with free agency when they did, even though there were a number of people around the league who did not want them to open free agency then. It's why they did the draft when they did, even though the general managers and head coaches, a lot of them did not want them to do the draft. They were concerned about whether it would be able to go off uh, technically. Um, and, and it's why they're doing the virtual off seasons now, because they want to try to stay as on schedule as they can uh, until they can't, uh, you know, uh, unless something gets in the way. Nobody really knows if training camps are going to be able to open on time. Nobody knows if they're going to be able to do any on-field work even during the off-season programs. Um, but that's what they're focused on now. Can they get people back into the team facilities? And what's the protocol going to be? Is is everybody on the team going to is everybody going to be allowed to go back to work when they open the building? So uh, not just the players and the coaches and the equipment staff and the trainers, but you know, is the accounting department going to go back to work? Um, are the ticket sales people going to go back to the work? Or if they can still do their jobs remotely, did, did they work remotely and you only bring in some people? They're looking at that. They're looking at what's the protocol going to have to be for disinfecting everything. Um, you know, the NBA sort of put out um, some, what their standards are going to be. They're trying to reopen starting May 8th, some of their facilities. And those things are worth watching because all of the teams, all of the leagues, rather, have to do the same things, right? So the NBA put out some things about, you know, when you enter a team facility, you're going to have to put your cell phone someplace, and that cell phone's going to be disinfected. And then when you leave the facility, you can pick up your cell phone. Players are going to have to probably be quarantined and kept away from the public. People are going to have to be tested a lot. Um, if anybody tests positive, they're going to be pulled away from the team and sent away. Um, there's a lot, a lot of details that they have to sort through, but that's the first priority for the NFL. They'd like to be able to get teams back in time to do some on-field work uh, during the off-season program, because as it was explained to me by Dr. Alan Sills, who's the chief medical officer of the league, the longer, the more time you miss in the off-season, the more you have to build in time um, at training camp. So you wanna try to keep things as normal as you can so that you don't have delays when we finally get back together. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I really don't have any defini anything definitive to say about this, except, you know, you're hoping for the best 
Um, and there are so many unknowns to this point still. Uh, I, I really think that uh, there's a couple of things that I would think the NFL will be doing. You know, number one is watching some of the states that are gradually or drastically reopening to see if there is a second wave that results from this. And then I also think that they're going to be watching the NBA and maybe even Major League Baseball to see, you know, because so many things we've heard about Major League Baseball may be doing, you know, the whole send all the teams to Arizona, quarantine them all, and play the games at two or three sites and just, you know, keep everybody there for, you know, the entirety of a baseball season. Um, yeah. You know, I, definitely, all the leagues are watching each other. There's no question. And, and the NFL has the advantage of time on their side because the other leagues have to go first, right? The NBA is trying to figure out, can they even resume their season? Major League Baseball is just trying to get to opening day. Um, so the NFL has the luxury of being able to, to wait. They don't have to make any of these decisions yet, but you better believe they are watching, for instance, when the NBA opens their facilities. You better believe the NFL is watching to see how that goes. And again, like you said, to see as more states open up, you know, do the cases start to rise and then do they have to shut businesses down again? Um, they're watching very closely. As it was explained to me by somebody in the league office, they don't have to make decisions now, so they're not going to make decisions now. All of us on the outside are antsy for answers. We want to know if training camps are going to open on time. They don't have to make those decisions yet, and they don't have to make them for a while, so they're going to they're going to wait. They've got a million contingency plans they're working on, but they're going to wait and watch and see because, as, as you guys know, like news changes so quickly um, over these last few weeks. We don't know what the situation is going to look like in two weeks or two months. So they are going to work on their contingencies. They're going to release the schedule next week, and then they're going to watch and try to figure out how, how they keep going incrementally until we get to a point where they have to make a decision about the season. Judy, you mentioned the schedule being released next week, and that's what, you know, everyone is under the assumption that's going to be happening. You normally at this point before the draft, you have the preseason schedule, the regular season schedule. Do you think there's going to have to be contingency plans for in case if maybe there's not a game or something like that when the schedule is released? Yeah, I think the schedule they're going to release is going to be a normal schedule, 16 games in the regular season, I, you know, starting on time. I th so I think the schedule that we're going to see whenever they do it next week, Thursday, Friday, whatever day it's going to be, um, is, is going to look like a normal schedule. There are, a, there are going to be a lot of contingency plans, right? I mean, there are going to be contingencies for if the season has to start a few weeks late and everything gets pushed back and, you know, you're playing the Super Bowl deeper into February sometime. Uh, there are certainly going to be contingencies if they have to shorten the season, which they don't want to do. They want to play the full slate, but who knows? Um, th so there will be things built into the schedule that, you know, you can take some games out if you have to play a reduced schedule. There are going to be contingency plans, and I, and I think the league will emphasize that, that here's the schedule as we hope to play, and we're going to do everything we can to play it as a normal season, a normal schedule, but there are a lot of things we can do um, if we have to change on the fly. Um, you know, one thing that people have said to me is, even if you start the season on time, what happens if there is a big uptick again in cases, you know, in the winter around flu season, what do you do? Do you play? Do you stop the season? I, you know, do you, uh, again, do you move teams to parts of the country that are maybe not affected? All of those things have to be considered. Um, but I, I do think the schedule release that we're going to see, you know, next week is, is going to look like a normal schedule. It's going to be interesting to me if they make the schedule uh, in a way that will allow for the contingencies to be implemented simply. For example, you know, schedule uh, the cross-conference games early. So mm -hmm. if, you, if, you have to, if you can't start on time and you need to postpone things, you can just lop them off right at the top as opposed to going back in and trying to reconfigure the whole thing. Um, and, you know, the other thing that's going to be interesting to me, you know, we talked about TV and how that's such a, a, a golden goose for the league and they want to fulfill their television contracts. You know, the networks you know, typically in the making of the schedule, they want to have a little input and they're going to want to see 
uh, more Tampa Bay on Sunday night and maybe Monday night than normal and, you know, those kinds of things. And so, you know, how does, how does the league with the schedule makers within the league balance that and juggle that with, you know, some of the other things we're talking about in terms of, you know, trying to make it simple if they have to make a major adjustment on the fly. Um, you know, I've never, ever envied the people who are in charge of making the schedule in a normal year. Now, I wouldn't, I mean, to me, this is just, uh, you know, it's almost like throwing dark, you know, darts at a board, um, you know, the way Dan Rooney used to do it in the 40s or, you know, arrange the dominoes on the, on the table. I mean, this is just, uh, to me, it's, it looks like an impossible task from, from my yeah, you know, every, every year I talk to Howard Katz after the schedule is released and it's Howard Katz's department that does the schedule. And every year he says like, you know, it's insane. They have all kinds of requests from the teams, like, you know, teams in Florida don't want to play one o'clock games because it's too hot and their fans don't like to sit there. You've got, you know, the Taylor Swift concert tour. You've got to build the schedule around. You've got you know, a few years ago, the Pope coming to the United States and saying mass in Philadelphia, so you can't have a home game. So, it, you know, all kinds of things that we can't even conceive of that they, in addition to, as you pointed out, the network saying, we want lots of Patrick Mahomes, we want the Steelers because they always draw, we want Tom Brady in Tampa. Well, now you've got to build in the idea of how do we construct a schedule, like you said, if we have to push everything back, are the stadiums still available? If we have to lop off, you know, four games, how do we do that easily? I agree with you. I think I don't know what the schedule is going to look like, but I suspect it's going to be pretty obvious when we see it um, that it's been constructed, you know, that it'll be easy to alter. And I, I agree with you. I think, you know, they're probably going to save the division games for later so that if the season has to be shortened, you at least get the division games in and the conference games in. And I suspect, you know, the, the games that are across the two conferences will, you know, they'll probably be the ones that are built into the schedule to be taken out if, if they have to shorten the schedule. But again, they really would like to play the full schedule. That's going to be a priority to try to figure out how to play a, a regular season, a full regular season. All right. Well, Judy, we really appreciate your time, your insight. We hope you stay safe and well. And we do hope to see you in person, whether it's in La Trobe, Heinz Field, wherever, uh, coming soon. Absolutely. It's great to see you guys virtually, and I can't wait until we can all have dinner together again. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much to Judy Batista and Bob Lariola. That is going to do it for this week's Steelers Virtual Roundtable.